Just two weeks ago, Singapore was recognized as a smart city of 2018 at the Smart City Expo World Congress held in Barcelona. Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong launched our Smart Nation initiative back in 2014 and the country's been on a journey to adopt digital and smart technologies for all Singaporeans across all aspects of life, for whether you're an individual citizen, even for businesses and government services as well. But what defines smartness and what really makes Singapore stand out compared to other smart cities. Today, we're very happy to welcome a special guest. Dr. Janil Puticherry is Senior Minister of State for the Ministry of Transport and the Ministry of Communications and Information. Dr. Janil joined politics in 2011 after he won a seat as a member of the Pasiris Pongol GRC. That was during the May 2011 general election. He's a pediatrician by training and took office in January 2016, first assuming the position of Minister of State at the Ministry of Communications and Information, as well as the Ministry of Education. Dr. General, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. First up, let's uh, let's uh, unpack that term that we hear so often, smart nation. How smart are we really as a nation and what really defines, what's at the heart of this smartness? Well, the interesting thing is how people see us and how we see ourselves is not quite the same thing. Mm. Uh, if you look around the world, people refer to us as a smart city and as a smart nation. And winning that award was part of the testament uh, to how people see us. They, they think we're this hyper-wired, hyper-connected, global city at the cutting edge of technology, and they congratulated us for it. They come and visit us. But when we look at how we see ourselves uh, and what we're trying to do with Smart Nation, the Realities that got us here 53 years after independence. You know, the, the story is well known, no resources, no hinterland, no, uh, no, no natural uh, advantages, and yet we've created this nation of success. Um, and we did so because we continually reinvented ourselves. And over the last 50 years, we've had a number of times when we've significantly changed what it means to be Singapore. And what what are the things that we do here, industries and the the things that we're striving for. And that's at the heart of this smart nation drive. So what we're doing now, uh, what's now about four years old since 2014, is Mm -hmm. just the latest wave of reinvention that Singapore is undertaking. This time, it's through technology and digital transformation. Okay. Well, Dr. Jenner, what what are the uh, tangible ways the the average Singaporean will benefit or, or, or ride this smart nation initiative? Well, some of it's very tangible today already. If you look at, for example, 4G connectivity, the sort of things that you can get through your uh, fiber optic cable, the services that you deliver in your homes, the number of businesses that have access to these sort of cutting edge products. Uh, but that's, it's got to be more than that. And we're looking at Smart Nation on three fronts. Uh, the first is digital, what we call digital economy. It's really looking at creating jobs and opportunities, transforming industries to take advantage of the best types of digital tools and technology. And, and really, I, I say that again, it's about creating opportunities and it's about creating jobs for Singaporeans. Mm-hmm. And that's a big part of what uh, mm-hmm. we're trying to do with Smart Nation, anchor those opportunities here in Singapore. So I just want to pick up on what you said about the latest wave of transformation. How do we ensure that different segments of the population are not left out? For example, the agent. Yes, I'm coming to that because that's (laughs) one of the other thrusts where there's three major thrusts. So what I've just talked about is digital economy, Mm -hmm. creating those opportunities. But you're absolutely right that as we do so, we've got to make sure we look at everybody. And one of the things about us in Singapore is we are a city and a state. When you look at what other nations are doing in terms of the smart transformation, they say, well, we'll focus on our capital and we'll do the rest of the country later or we'll focus on the CBD and we'll worry about the rest. We can't do that. We're all in this together. We're one city, one state. And so we have to make sure that everybody benefits. It's got to be inclusion by design, 100% inclusion by design. So what are we doing to ensure that everybody uh, gets involved? Well, there's a whole variety of things. And I think people are most worried about the elderly um, as a sort of a natural concern. Mm -hmm. I would start by saying we shouldn't actually assume that the elderly can't do this. You look at other societies that are doing this type of thing, Mm -hmm. uh, Korea and Japan and China, and the elderly are very much involved. And I think our elderly are quite capable and more than interested enough in order to do so. So first thing is, we've got to make sure the stuff that they're interested in. Uh, What are they interested in? And if you ask someone who's 20 
years old what their ideal grandma is interested in. They might say things like, oh, checking their health prescriptions and managing their appointments. If you ask the 80-year-old grandma, Ama does not want to do this. They would, she would much rather look at her Korean dramas, mm-hmm. uh, check their 4D, right, uh, you know, right. what the news is today. So we've got to make sure that the things that our seniors are interested in are accessible to them digitally. That's the starting position. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But we've got to come right at the other end. We've got to accept that there's going to be some people who have some difficulty doing this. And one of the programs we're rolling out is called Tech Connect. Mm-hmm. And that's looking at how we can leverage on our community centers. And uh, we're starting with eight as a pilot project, but we hope to roll this out across all our community centers where they can be a place that senior citizens and anyone else who's having difficulty um, getting involved in this digital transformation can go and look for help. Mm. Both the staff as well as the volunteers can mm. help people take advantage of this. So these are two ends of the spectrum, right? I mean, at one end, I talked about people who really can do this themselves, mm. even if they're 80 or 90. I mean, my dad's on WhatsApp, you know, 84 years old. <laughs> um, and right at the other end, people who find a lot of difficulty, we have to help them one by one. And in between, there's lots of opportunities for programs and ideas. Right. Okay, Singapore lost the uh, top spot and dropped to a second place in the digital competitiveness ranking of 63 economies by Swiss uh, Business School, uh, 1MD this year, IMD. Uh, While well, Singapore topped the knowledge and technology category, it only came in 15 for future readiness. Uh, and despite its, its digital friendly environment and high levels of training, obviously, and education, the society's attitude towards the adoption of technologies is ranked uh, 20th, you know. And the agility of businesses here to transform digitally uh, is ranked 18th, uh, scored relatively low. So, why do you think businesses, uh, particularly SMEs, remain conservative when it comes to digital transformation? Well, we shouldn't underestimate the difficulties that the small and medium enterprises face in this very competitive environment that we have here. And it is very competitive. We compete not just with the domestic market, but with regional and international markets. And for SMEs particularly, uh, they don't have that deep bench of manpower or strong financial reserves where they can afford to take the same risks as the big multinationals. I mean, that has you just... That is just the nature of the beast. And so uh, it's understandable that they're a little bit more conservative about the kind of risks associated with transforming their business model, transforming their operating model, uh, transforming their day-to-day operations. So we have to help them because if we believe that there's an advantage for them in doing this digital transformation, but they don't have the risk appetite in order to do so, we have to help manage the tension between those two things. So we've got a program, it's called SMEs Go Digital. Uh, IMDA manages this, and really it's looking at how we can bring together some solutions, curated solutions, uh, local products that support the ICT sector, ICT solutions, and match SMEs to the solutions uh, that are most appropriate. The program's been running for about a year, and so far we've helped about a 1,000 different businesses. And, And we have to do more, and we have to scale this up. Now, but that's not all. There's more. Um, That's the business ecosystem. But the other big point of friction for SMEs is the government, interfacing with government, Mm. interfacing with the state-delivered services. So this is a very different approach that we have to take. Uh, The third big thrust of our Smart Nation initiative is digital government. I talked about digital economy. Uh, You asked me about digital society, Mm. the elderly. And the big thing that we're doing in between is digital government. Now, when it comes to businesses, I mean, there's a lot of things that we're doing in the digital government. It's not just about businesses, but when it comes to businesses, um, two major projects under digital government that give you a sense of how we're trying to do this. Uh, One is the uh, business grants portal. There's lots of different agencies and ministries and stat boards which support businesses in different ways. But it's a real pain for the small and medium enterprise owner to navigate and apply here and give your documents. and, And what we want to do is bring all of that together. So take a business-centric approach. Say, you as a business in FNB, for example, what are all the different grants we can bring to you and make it easy for them to access? So streamlining the work of government to help businesses. The second thing is that you take starting a new business or starting a new business, or a new enterprise under a business, you have to apply for licenses. Um, and again, those licenses are spread across a whole bunch of agencies and ministries. And we've got the License One portal where we're bringing together all of those license application processes. So these are two examples of how we're doing digital government in order to help businesses thrive in the new environment. He's Dr. Janil Putucheri, Senior Minister of State for the Ministry of Transport and the Ministry of Communications and Information. We will be discussing transport issues in just a while. But Dr. Janil, I want to uh, pick up on that point of businesses and technology in terms of a push towards becoming a fintech hub. What is high on the uh, government's list of priorities when it comes to attaining that goal, a fintech hub? Well, fintech, um, it's, it's, it's not a goal in and itself. It's a key enabler of so much 
else that we want to do. We've got to get things right in terms of uh, payments. Uh, we've got to get things right in terms of security and transactions and bringing everybody on board. If you look at what Singapore offers the world today mm -hmm. and what being in Singapore offers to businesses that are here, that engagement with financial services is a very key part of our competitive advantage. Now, what does being a competitive player in financial services mean in 2018? It means that you have to get going with fintech. And so we've done a number of things. We've got um, the backbone of interbank payments with FAST that's been around since 2014. Uh, we've got Pay Now since July 2017 and we've got uh, Pay Now Corporate in August this year. Basically trying to look and see how we can enable businesses to use e-payments and digital forms of transactions between different financial entities to try to reduce the cost of business, increase the security and privacy around financial transactions, and enable new businesses to kind of be created. At the same time, we've got things like our SGQR code, standardizing how it interfaces with the real world. Um, Nets has been appointed as a master acquirer for hawkers and coffee shops. As you can see, there's a thousand and one little pieces that we've got out there. These are really operational tactical moves. But what's the big picture view? It's how do you take those advantages around payments and financial services and, and cash transaction processes and translate them into the same idea digitally. Singapore needs to be a place where it's easy to do good business digitally. Mm -hmm. And getting fintech right is a core part of that. Okay. Well, so generally, if, even as technology use in banking and the businesses increase in pervasiveness, how is the government managing risks in individual privacy and uh, consumer interest? Well, the first thing is to say that this is actually a very, very important problem. This, mm -hmm. this is not something we can do later, something that we can do after the fact. Um, if you look at what we've done since 2014, actually, we began with issues of privacy and security. We started the Cybersecurity Agency three years ago. We started the Personal Data Protection Commission three years ago. We passed the Personal Data Protection Act three years ago, and we're reviewing it this year. Cybersecurity Act comes in this year. We've passed the uh, Public Service Governance Act to make it a criminal offense to uh, de-identify, re-identify, uh, anonymize data. So we took it very, very seriously. We put the laws in place. We got the uh, uniformed service personnel in place and we gave them the tools to get things done. And we did all that in the last four years prior to making all the different pushes that we're doing now with our strategic national projects. So we took privacy and security. We put it right up front and said, what is it that we need to do? Three, three four years later, we've got to review quite a lot of those things. And that's exactly what we're doing. The next phase is to take that approach. And if you look at the payment services bill that was just placed before parliament, we're going to debate it next year. I think it's uh, January or February, first quarter next year. That takes that same lens of security, privacy, and doing so in order to enable business and applies it to the financial world. So we're doing this upfront, privacy and security upfront, reassure the public, reassure businesses that this is going to be a safe space in order to get things done. Dr. Janil, the Smart Initiative, Smart Nation Initiative was launched in 2014. Uh, if you could give it a scorecard, you mentioned it's a wave of transformation. How far have we come since? Well... Yeah, I, I'm not going to give you a grade. I mean, we're moving away from grades. You know, I came from MOE and we're trying to de-emphasize grades. Okay? Uh, you, know? you can give so, us stars. No, yeah, yeah, well, you know, it's a rainbow sticker. You know, uh, um, we, we've done a lot. Uh, seriously, in the last four years, we've done, a, we've done a lot. We've made huge progress. But the thing is that everything that we do, every project that is successful actually opens up new avenues, mm -hmm. new possibilities, new risks, as well as new opportunities. This is going to be a constant um, um, way of doing business. This is a constant way of thinking. So this is not something that we launched in 2014 and we're saying we're landing in 20-whatever. Mm -hmm. We launched in 2014 and we're just going to keep going. And if I get back to where we started, this is really just the latest set of tools and thinking around how Singapore needs to reinvent ourselves. So we're never going to be done. You know, you mentioned this is inclusion by design, this latest wave of transformation. Um, how important and what are the avenues so that this is not just a top-down initiative, but the needs of businesses and individuals are heard as well? Well, we've had the digital readiness blueprint. I mean, so some places call it digital society, some places call it digital readiness. We launched in the middle of the year a digital readiness blueprint. And so that sets out our priorities, our plans and our targets. And But we didn't stop there. That's just a piece of paper. We've got to make it happen. And what we're doing is we've got a digital readiness steering committee that's been brought together and that uh, well committee council but basically to bring businesses together with private individuals representing the community as well as government and really say look 
In order to do this inclusion by design, actually there's a cost involved. Actually, the person who does it most and does it best has a slight disadvantage against the business competitor who says, I, I don't care about business inclusion, I'm going for maximum profits. But if the entire community sees that ultimately, if we get inclusion by design right, we really do bring everybody in, you're enlarging the market, you're enlarging the opportunities, and if everybody can do that in lockstep together, net net everybody's better off and that's what we're trying to do manage the sense of uh, fear and cost and make sure everybody sees the benefit and come up with concrete examples of how we can take this forward I gave you that example of the Tech Connect that's mm -hmm. what government's mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole bunch of programs that the community is doing to train people and businesses are now getting together and thinking how they can for example pledge towards digital inclusion what are the steps they can take to, in order to then drive inclusion by design. And, and I can expect, and I think I fully understand that uh, it's going to take longer for businesses to come forward with this. It's very easy. It's much easier for government and community to do, and it's much harder for businesses to do. But they've started. I think it's very commendable that they've started, uh, and we've got to help them do this. Well, we've been talking all the while about uh, Smart Nation here in Singapore and how we are, how is the progress so far for Singapore as a Smart Nation. He's the Senior Minister of State for Ministry of Transport and the Ministry of Communications and Information, Dr. Janu Puttucherry. After the news, we'll be coming back with more, uh, this time on the transport here in Singapore. We have a very special guest with us in the studio. Dr. Janil Putucheri is Senior Minister of State for the Ministry of Transport and the Ministry of Communications and Information. We spoke earlier about Singapore's journey to become a smart nation, but we're shifting gears to J Dr. Janil's other portfolio, transport. Let's start with an issue that's close to many Singaporeans' hearts, and that is rail reliability. Um, how is the government leveraging technology to address rail reliability? Well, we've made great strides on rail reliability, and you have to realize that uh, this year our mean kilometers between failure, which is the standard marker of the rail reliability, has improved three times. It's now 661,000 kilometers, and that's a three times improvement that we've seen this year. So the first thing I want to point out is that our efforts are paying off, and I think uh, commuters and consumers are, are starting to notice. Technology forms part of it. I mean, certainly um, rail is a technological um, um, sort of uh, endeavor. It's, 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 you, get to, you get to go on rail because of the technology that's there. But it's not all there is to it. I mean, we've done quite a lot. We've uh, replaced the, um, the sleepers. We've replaced uh, the third rail, the communications, uh, the train-based communications. And we've got a whole bunch of other stuff, power supply, uh, some of the trains itself, the trackside circuits. All that's coming up. Those are the technologies that we are going to refresh. Mm -hmm. So replacing the, and improving the technologies that we do have is a key component of improving rail reliability and that's what we've been doing and we have to keep doing it. But there are two other things that we have to think about. One is how we can, can we use technology in a different way. So things like predictive maintenance. So using data analytics and sensors that we want to embed and we have embedded throughout our rail network to then not just do things on a routine basis or po post failure, but go and do maintenance before it becomes absolutely necessary, predictive maintenance, um, and, and target our efforts in that way. Um, the second component is really thinking of doing things in a different way. So different tools, just talked about, and then doing things in a different way. So one example is what we've done with early closure, late opening. We've just had to basically say there's a trade-off and if we can close the MRT system earlier or open up later on a weekend morning, it gives the engineers a lot more time to do stuff overnight. And that's not just substituting two hours here for six hours there. It's act You can do different things when you have a big chunk of time. You can lift out whole parts of the rail, you can replace very complex systems. So there's three, th three fronts that we're talking about to answer your question. First, replacing and updating and refreshing the technology we have. Second, using technology to do different engineering um, solutions to the kinds of problems we have. And the third is not really technology, but thinking of how we can do things differently to, to use what we have. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Janet, how, how close are we to achieving the government's vision of a car light society? I mean, what are some of the challenges that you think we need to overcome? Well, firstly, I'm going to say it's not just the government's vision. <laughs> uh, I noticed you were doing the traffic updates just now, and mm -hmm. I want to point out that you're only reaching out to one third of Singaporeans mm -hmm. because at peak hour now, <laughs> two thirds of Singaporeans are commuting using public transport. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not just the government that's thinking of a car light society. Mm -hmm. Commuters at peak hour right. are going for a car light mm. uh, way of getting home. And so today, two thirds at peak hour, 39% uh, of households don't own a car. So 60% of Singaporeans 
cope without their owning a car. Mm. Doesn't mean they don't use a car because they might use a taxi, they might mm. use a point to point service, but they don't necessarily need to own a car. So, in that way, it's not the government's vision of a car light Singapore. I think Singaporeans are moving towards a car light vision. And this is one of the things that we found in our land transport master plan engagements, our focus group discussions, our e poll, and our public consultation document responses is that more than two thirds of Singaporeans are uh, asking for, supporting, um, and uh, pushing for what we would call a walk cycle ride vision. Mm-hmm. We're we'll not quite using car light. We're mm-hmm. calling it walk cycle ride. Why right. are we doing that? Well, the walking is obvious, the cycling is obvious. But when we say ride, what we mean is riding an MRT, riding a bus, and riding a car that you don't own. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, point to point, uh, you know, uh, don't want to advertise the, the, any particular <laughs> operator, but you know who they are. And taxis, right? right? So actually, it's everything but owning a car. So it's not quite car light versus non car light. Right. It's car owned versus not owning your own car. And two thirds of Singaporeans perhaps more support this vision. So we're, we're making progress. We're making progress. And um, this business of more people using public transport at peak hour and less households owning a car has continued to improve year on year, even though the demand for transport is growing at 5%. Mm -hmm. So it's not a static need for transport. It's an increasing demand for transport and a reduction in the need for owning a car. So we're, we're moving in that direction. Uh, Shifting gears to Singapore's smart nation drive and smart urban mobility for the people who are the two-thirds of Singaporeans in buses right now. Uh, Share with us a little of the vision for autonomous vehicles in Singapore and how that could possibly transform our urban landscape. Well, we think autonomous vehicles are a key component of the kind of transport landscape we want over the next 20 years. When exactly it will happen? Well, we have a roadmap. We don't have quite a destination. When it comes to autonomous cars, um, we're assuming that this from an engineering point of view, is going to be solved somewhere else. And there are a lot of people pushing on this. Uh, We have to then be ready from a a legal point of view, a a regulatory point of view. But we are focusing our effort on autonomous buses. Mm. Uh, We want to have autonomous vehicles as as a solution for public transport. So this is not theoretical, it's not science fiction, it's already happening. So today we've got 70 kilometers of roads, uh, one north and Sentosa, where uh, autonomous vehicles are being tested on a real road. I mean, it's, this is not a, a test track. We have a test track, there's a CTRAN facility at, with NTU, where we can do the basic engineering and the safety. Then we have these 70 kilometers of roads. We've committed to having them in towns, town-wide deployment in Pungol, Tengah, and the Jurong Innovation District by 2023. So that means that these autonomous buses then will be operating real routes. You'll have to use your EasyLink card or maybe not even your EasyLink card, whatever is the the technology of the time in 2023 to use these autonomous buses for public transport. And we've committed to having nationwide routes supported by autonomous buses by 2030. So we have a roadmap. It's already started and we're working on it. And if we can get this right, it has a few advantages for Singapore. Mm -hmm. Firstly, there's the engineering associated with autonomous buses. Somebody's got to manufacture the components, work out how to design the software. It's going to create jobs. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there's also a whole series of jobs of how you operate a fleet of autonomous buses. Uh, How do you maintain them? How do you integrate them with other parts of the public transport network? And no one's paying anywhere near as much attention as we are and we think this is an opportunity for us to have a competitive advantage. Okay, talking about buses, uh, for buses, general buses right now, what are some of the upcoming developments that commuters can can look forward to? Maybe you want to share with us? Well, there are three major aspects in the short term that we're trying to think about how we can use technology and technology-associated uh, ideas in order to improve the bus uh, commute. Uh, we've got some diesel hybrid buses already rolling out and we've, uh, we've got some electric buses also, you know, we have plans, the tenders have been called and these things are being developed. So over the next few months and years, you will see, uh, I think it's 50 or 60 diesel hybrid buses and about 50 electric buses that will then become part of the fleet. Um, now, you may or may not notice them from the outside. They should, you know, I presume have the same colors and liveries with whoever's operating them. But when you're inside, you should certainly notice them in terms of being quieter, uh, using the best types of technology in terms of the ride that you have. Uh, we're hoping that they can have information displays that keep the commuters a bit more informed. Uh, Some of our latest buses have little USB charging ports. Uh, So, you know, we're trying to change the bus experience from what you experience when you sit down, what the fleet operator has benefits from in terms of maintenance and energy, an electric bus, for example, and also how it helps the environment. Pollution will be reduced. So those are two important things. 
From a policy side, one thing that we're trying is what we call on-demand shuttle buses. So rather than having a fixed route, you maybe have an app or something where you aggregate demand. And having on-demand shuttle buses uh, may well change how we use buses. Um, and we think there's something that's worthwhile. We're experimenting. and We're going to see how far we can go with this. So the electric buses we know will significantly help reduce air pollution. Uh, the cost, though, of maintenance, could that prove higher than that of diesel buses? Well, in the short term, I, likely it will. Uh, like any new technology, as you're starting to get going, you understand where the efficiencies are, where the operational issues are. It may be that there's a cost issue. But over the long term, it's likely that uh, it, this will reduce just in terms of volume and scale as more and more come along. But with electric buses and electric motors in general, mm. um, you because you're not handling a, a biological substance, a combustible substance, fuel, mm. and the interface between it, it potentially maintenance, actually, maintenance costs could potentially Potentially come down, especially if we standardize quite a lot of the components and quite a lot of the, the, the battery interfaces and so on and so forth. That is certainly the intent. And for people working on electric vehicles around the world, a reduction in total life cycle cost is a key advantage that they can see. And that's why they're investing so much time, effort and money into it. Mm-hmm. Okay, how, how will e-payments feature this push for a smart mobility, urban mobility? You're not going to have smart urban mobility without e-payments. It's a non-starter. <laughs> e-payments is, uh, like several other things, uh, kind of the, the rails on which the smart nation needs to run. Mm-hmm. This is a key enabler in order to have smart uh, urban mobility. And what do I mean by smart urban mobility, by the way? It's worth talking about that. Mobility as a service. So you as a commuter then have a choice of integrating different modes of commute. So you could perhaps take a shared bike to the MRT station and then at at the other end of your ride you could integrate with a bus seamlessly or with a point-to-point car uh, or maybe another scooter or something and you have from door to door maybe two or three different solutions. That's actually what you're doing today already. But you're engaging with different uh, providers, you're using different tickets and if you are using an app, you're using different apps. Mm. So the thing to do then is to bring all that in one platform where you say, this is where I want to get to. And in in one platform, I want to be able to see what my options are. And ideally, in one platform, I need to be able to then pay because I have to compare prices in order to make my choice. None of this is going to happen unless e-payments is around. Mm -hmm. And you need all these different uh, transport operators to integrate with e-payment solutions. Uh, So e-payments is a key enabler of smart urban mobility and mobility as a service. And that's one of the reasons why we have to push so hard at getting e-payments right. And what we do in transport, what e-payments allows for transport, you can imagine will then make make possible all kinds of opportunities in so many other industries. Dr. Janil, you're aware of multiple hats. Before we let you go, uh, we have to find out what has been the most challenging aspects of your job. For the listener, uh, Dr. Janil is Senior Minister of State at two ministries. He's also Chairman of OnePeople.sg and the People's Association Youth Movement Panel of Advisors. So a lot on your plate. What has been your biggest challenge? Uh, my biggest challenge? Well, I guess in some ways I'm, I'm a father to three children. And, you know, when I have to explain what uh, the government is doing uh, uh, and how it might affect their lives growing up, when I explain to my ch- three children, I have no staff around, I have no assistance from my ministry, and my three children give me no quarter and hold me to task. So sometimes uh, explaining government policy to them is my biggest challenge. Oh, I see. Because we wanted to find out how you manage your time. Uh, No, I look at my phone and it tells me where to go. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for the vision that you painted of Singapore uh, to come. Great pleasure speaking with you. Dr. Janil Putucheri there, Senior Minister of State for the Ministry of Transport and the Ministry of Communications and Information. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Money FM 89.3